good morning to all of you and the women's cell and the department of english borobaja victim to memorial college that is located in purulia west bengal india welcome you all to this a uh, week long international level faculty development program on gender sensitivity now before moving to the sessions of this third day i am requesting all the participants listening on youtube live to remember these three points and at the same time i am overwhelmed to witness such a huge response on your side and please don't ask for the assignment from the very beginning and kindly note that if you want to ask any question to any speaker during this, this fdp please send those to the whatsapp number that i will show in the comment section of something and apply and all the assignments based on the topics of the presentation will be given to the participants daily and they must have to submit the assignments within 12 hours all have to submit that within 10 a i hope that you all have enjoyed yesterday sessions and i am sure that today also we all will be will be enriched and also will get to know the picture of south asia and especially our neighboring country namely bangladesh and also the issues that is related highly with gender in the us so today we have with us three eminent speakers namely a professor niladri r chatterjee from india dr tania hak from bangladesh and dr bonnie sir from the us and these three speakers from this three different regions rather geographical locations prove that we the academicians don't believe in any kind of border narratives and partition among us and we are happy to collaborate academically for our collective betterment for giving more strength to our academic fraternity and for raising our voice for men women and lgbt communities whenever is needed we all must have to remember that gender is a term that refers to social and cultural distinctions and roles associated with being male or female gender identity is the extent to which one identifies as being either masculine or feminine and as gender is such a primary dimension of of identity socialization institutional participation and life changes <coughs> sociologists refer to it as a core status but that dichotomous view of gender that is the notion that is one is either being male or female is is specific to certain cultures and is not universal so we need to learn and relearn the very definition of gender and our very first invited speaker professor niladri ranjan chatterjee is here to make us remember again what is gender and before leaving this virtual platform professor chatterjee let me introduce him although he doesn't need any kind of introduction niladri chatterjee is a professor at the department of english university of polony west bengal His doctoral work was on the novelist Christopher Isherwood, a, a, a recipient of Fulbright Scholarship for which he went to University of Texas at Austin and the British Council Charles Wallace Fellowship at University of Cambridge. Professor Chatterjee has co-edited The Muffled Heart, Stories of the Disempowered Male. It is published from New Delhi Rupa and co-publication at the year 2005 and he he contributed to the american research route university of minnesota press uh, gibtq.com and oxford dictionary of national bibliography the research route century and readers companion to 20th century writers so means he has a lot of publication to his credit and a lot of reputed publication he has published in the journal american notes and quotes it is published by ian apple and francis and intersections and has reviewed for gay and lesbian review review worldwide he was also a member of the editorial board of the affordments and anq in march 2011 he served as visiting faculty at the department of english university of north bengal he has been teaching a course in the gender studies at his university since 2009 and runs a facebook group called new gender studies which has over 14000 members Professor Chatterjee has recently begun contributing to the world, and with and with late Tatun Mukherjee, he co-edited *Naver*, *Androgyny*, and *Female Impersonation* in India, published from New York Books, uh, New Delhi, in 2016. Now I am requesting Professor Chatterjee 
conversation. <coughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gautam. Um, thank you also for um, asking me to speak at this very important uh, faculty development program. Um, I have spoken to faculty development programs before, um, and I, I realize how important they are, because I think we always have to keep in touch with the ways in which um, right. sort of, you know, our educational disciplines are developing, the rate at which, um, the way in which we um, produce knowledge is developing, the way in which we understand um, ourselves, our identities, uh, they are also developing. So, um, and these developments are happening constantly. They are happening daily, uh, and it it does uh, occasionally begin to look a little impossible um, to to keep abreast of his, of these developments. So, I think these faculty development programs are incredibly useful because they at least serve as um, a window into the ways in which we are continuing to think about ourselves broadly and the rubrics that we are creating for the production of knowledge, for the dissemination of knowledge and for the circulation of knowledge. Um, gender has been a very important area in studies, uh, sort of in academic disciplines for several decades now. Um, it, it actually began to concretize sometime in the late 20th century. And subsequently, from the 1960s, 70s onwards, um, gender studies departments um, have gradually, uh, but very steadily, developed in, in academic uh, campuses, uh, in, in colleges, at universities across the world, um, which is why we have um, the representation of so many countries um, at this particular faculty development program, which of course makes me very, very happy. But I also am a little concerned because I somehow am getting a little um, tired um, of uh, having to explain to people still that when I mention gender, I don't necessarily mean women, uh, and I don't necessarily mean cis women. So who is a cis woman? That is something that, of course, we are going to come to much later. Who is a cis woman? Who is a cis man? But I think there is a way in which gender um, has been turned into almost like a synonym for, uh, for, for the woman, for womanhood, for the feminine. Uh, and I think that, I think, is unconsciously patriarchal. We don't even realize how patriarchal it is, but it is unconsciously patriarchal because what it does is that it actually um, lets uh, masculinity or men off the hook. So therefore, there is no analysis that happens on, on masculinity. Uh, and as a result of that, um, the almost exclusive focus, not just on femininity, but on cis women, um, rather restricts the enormous power uh, that the lens of gender has. Um, and I find that this restriction is ultimately extremely um, counterproductive to the whole project of gender studies. And so I think what I wish to talk about today is uh, what exactly is gender uh, and uh, maybe ask some very basic questions as to um, how one can uh, read gender, how is gender read, uh, how is gender performed, how is gender produced, um, and, and uh, how do we actually think about gender consciously or unconsciously all the time. So gender is something that informs every single thing that we do almost. Uh, and it and it's such an important part of the way in which we think about life that I find it um, a little strange when people sort of invite me to talk at um, the programs about gender sensitization because I every time somebody invites me to speak at a program about gender sensitization, I say that well, I simply can't understand what I can say about gender sensitization because we are gender sensitized 
from the time we are born. What patriarchy is obsessed with is gender sensitization, which is why we have the problems that we do. So, so gender sensitization, I don't quite understand. Um, but there are, there are ways in which one can talk about gender which are not patriarchal. Because very often what happens is when you are talking about gender, it becomes unconsciously patriarchal. So there are ways of talking about gender which are not patriarchal. And today what I wish to do is I am going to um, use um, the binary um, of stability and instability. So those two are going to be the binaries that I shall use to try and understand how gender develops. Yes, in our life, in, in culture, in society, how gender develops along the line of stability and instability. Now, when we basically talk about the idea of stability or the moment we mention stability, that automatically creates a sense of comfort within us. So we are all very happy to have a kind of stability in our lives, at least most people are, right? So therefore, you know, uh, who is there in the world who would say, um, I would like to have um, a kind of employment that is unstable. I would like to have an employment where it would be fun to wake up the next morning and to find a notice from the boss saying, you are not required to come to the office anymore. I'm so sorry, you have lost your job, right? I can't imagine too many people who would want a job like that. They would all, most of us at least, would want that kind of um, stability of, of a regular income. Many of us would want to have uh, the stability um, of, of a relationship, uh, of a romantic sexual relationship, which is why we have created this extraordinary institution of marriage, because supposedly marriage affords us some kind of um, sexual, emotional, social, cultural stability. We uh, sort of go to great lengths in order to ensure stability in many, many aspects of our life. So therefore, as an idea, stability is something which we prize. And that stability is something which we constantly try to link to the material. So therefore, we like things that we can hold on to. We like things that are tangible. We like things that are palpable. We like things that we can possess. Because we somehow like the idea that once I have something, it will always be mine. So it becomes a stable part of my identity. Unless I decide to sell it off. So there is a way in which um, the people uh, enjoy uh, antique furniture because they believe that antique furniture gives them a sense of stability. Look at the quality of the work. Look how wonderful the quality of the wood is. This chair was made 500 years ago, etc., etc. So we constantly valorize stability. And this valorization of stability uh, plays a very important role in the way in which gender is stabilized. And gender is stabilized at the material level of the body. So that is the first point that, that I would wish to make, is that gender is stabilized primarily on the level of the body because we have this extraordinary notion that the body is a very stable ground. The body is a stable ground on which you can build other structures. And because the body is a very stable ground, if you build on that body these other structures, those structures will also turn out to be stable because the body is regarded as a sure foundation. So then we regard the body as the base 
as it were and many many identities that subsequently are brought to construct upon the body are basically regarded as the superstructure so therefore uh, religion um, ethnicity race class caste nationality and these are all uh, employment status marital status they are all constructed on the body so the body acquires a kind of um, foundationalist value which patriarchy absolutely loves because according to patriarchy the body does not change and it is the unchangeable supposedly unchangeable nature of the body which gives it such a firm base now before i go on to how gender is constructed let me um, ask you something to, to sort of basically uh, try and understand exactly what is the stability that the body has. Okay. So if you think that the body is stable, then um, after some time you are going to need um, a pacemaker. Okay, so the pacemaker is inserted into the body then somebody is going to tell you that you may need a hip replacement. So the hip replacement operations happens. Then somebody is going to tell you that, oh, I think the knees can be changed as well. So then the knees get replaced. Somebody says that I think you may require a kidney transplant. So then the kidney, somebody else's kidney is given to you. You probably, there, there, there have also been instances of a heart transplant. So the heart has been transplanted, right? So here is the question. If the body is stable, then what is the stability that the body retains after it has had a hip replacement, knee replacement, heart transplant, pacemaker, and God knows what else? What is the stability of that particular body? To which you are going to say, well, uh, that is the soul. Yes, true. But then does the soul have any material presence? Can you see the soul? Can you touch the soul? You can't. So therefore, the body is actually constantly changing. Old cells are dying, new cells are getting born, our bodies are changing every single second and yet we still think about the body as being stable. And it is this stability which patriarchy creates, this is the stability that patriarchy manufactures. You are going to say that, oh, but I mean, my thoughts are after all stable, are they? Don't you change your mind? Don't you think that the things that you believed when you were a child are no longer valid? Don't you switch from one ideology to another? Winston Churchill had very famously said that he is a fool who is not left wing when young and right wing when old. So across your life, your political ideology can change as well. You may be a communist when you are a 25 year old, you can be a, a fascist as a 52 year old. So there are several changes are happening to you and yet patriarchy consistently tells you that the body is a sure, firm ground on which to construct stable realities, stable identities. Where does all this start? Well. What we have been taught by patriarchy is that um, we are born and I'm very, I am so tired uh, of hearing the phrase biological sex. There is no such thing as biological sex, but that is something that I'll come to later. So supposedly we are born with a biological sex. There is no such thing. But we are born with a biological sex. So therefore we are born male or we are born female. 
Uh, and then, of course, you know, um, anybody who has read the first paragraph of feminism will tell you that sex is biological, gender is social, so therefore gender is socially constructed. Okay. But it is socially constructed on what? It is socially constructed on the biology. So right there, there seems to be a very interesting binary of nature-nurture in the sense that supposedly um, nature is the sex with which we are born. Nurture is the gender that society gives us. And that has been the way in which feminism has talked about the sex-gender divide for decades upon decades upon decades. Until some feminists in the 1990s, most notably somebody called Judith Butler, comes around and says that there is something about this sex is biological, gender is social, it isn't making sense. And this is why she says it isn't making sense. Because she says that if sex is biological and if gender is social, then what are we going to say about desire? What are we going to say about sexuality? Because surely, according to the chronology, according to the story that patriarchy tells us, we are born male or female, then we become a man or a woman, and then we desire a woman or a man. So there is a certain story, there's a certain teleology that patriarchy has fed us, basically sex, gender, desire. We are born male, we become a man, we desire a woman. And this story has been repeated over centuries. But this is where Judith Butler makes an intervention. She says that is it really that? Or has patriarchy actually been telling us the story in reverse? Is it perhaps the case that sexuality comes first? That is to say, desire comes first and then gender comes later, and then sex comes third. So instead of calling sex one, gender two, desire three, is it desire one, gender two, sex three? How is this happening? What we really have to understand is that sex, what we call biological sex, would not be necessary, would not be necessary if we were not so interested, if we were not so invested in reproductive sexuality, by which I mean heterosexuality. So if heterosexuality as a structure, as a socio-political, religious, cultural structure did not exist, biological sex would not be necessary. Because the moment a child is born, what really happens is that what the child's hands and feet look like is not material, what the child's face looks like is not material. What is actually material is what is it that lies between the child's legs. So therefore, the genitalia of the child takes the most important place in the child's anatomy. And it is this genitalia which is used as the ground. It is the genitalia that is used as the foundation on which to construct gender. And once that gender is constructed, 
it is assumed that if the gender construction is correctly done, then the child will participate eventually in sexual reproduction. So this is where the story is. The story is that in order to consolidate heterosexuality, gender is constructed in twos. In order to construct gender in twos, sex is constructed retroactively. So therefore it is like uh, doing embarking on a research knowing beforehand what your research findings are going to be. What are you doing? I'm going to do a research. Okay. And uh, what do you hope to find? In my research, I hope to find that uh, so-and-so is the case. So even before you have actually conducted the research, you already have the result. If you already have the result, here is my question. Where is the research? So therefore, you are embarking on a research and you are going to plan the research in such a way that you are going to get the result that you want. Gender is constructed like that. In order to reach the aim of heterosexuality, gender is constructed on what is called biological sex. Now, why do I say that there is no thing as biological sex? Because the moment I say that there is something called biological sex, that there is nothing called biological sex, some of you are immediately going to say, oh, sir, but surely you have heard about chromosomes. You have heard about the XX chromosome and you've heard about the XY chromosome. Yes, I have heard about the XX chromosome and I've heard about the XY chromosome. But here is what I think you should know is that the Y chromosome is responsible for the gradual formation of the penis. Not Y chromosome exclusively. Y chromosome is helped with various other um, bits and pieces and you basically have the penis. And therefore, you then assume that the penis is a male sexual organ. The penis is, um, is, is a male excretory organ. Similarly, the moment the child is born with a vagina, you automatically read the vagina as female and then you start to build this elaborate structure of gender based on that vagina. So the vagina becomes the base on which a person's entire life is constructed. The penis becomes the base on which a person's entire life is constructed. Now, this is my question. And this question is uh, one that I would not have been able to come to without the wonderful, radical intervention that has been made by the trans body into gender studies. An absolutely radical intervention. Now, here is the intervention that the trans body makes. Many of you will be aware that a few years ago in Ecuador, a couple was expecting a child. Nothing unusual about that. Lots of couples expect children every minute. But the interesting thing about this particular couple from Ecuador is that the child was in the womb of the husband and the child had been conceived by the husband after having sexual intercourse with 
his wife who has a penis. I would want you to think about that for a bit. So the couple that we are talking about consists of a trans woman and a trans man, right? So therefore the trans woman thinks of herself as a woman and if she thinks of herself as a woman, then we have no right to question her gender identity. If she says she is a woman, then she is a woman. The trans man thinks of himself as a man, so we accept him as a man. If he says he's a man, he's a man. Now this is where it becomes really interesting. The trans man had undergone some sex reassignment surgery, but the trans man had retained his womb. He had retained his uterus. He had retained his ovaries. And the trans woman had also undergone several surgeries, several hormonal treatments, but she had retained her penis. She had retained her testicles. So she was still capable of having an erection and she was still capable of producing sperm. Now, here is the question that I want to ask you. If this particular trans women, if you're, if you're a doctor, if you are a doctor, and if you, for example, work in the um, gynecological department or in the urological department and the trans woman came to see you, you would say that, OK, um, yes, uh, let me see what is your problem. And she takes off her clothes. She shows you her genitalia and you're horrified. You say, oh, you, you have a penis. You're a man. But she says, no, yes, I have a penis, but I'm not a man. What are you going to say to her? Are you going to say, therefore, that I don't care what you think about yourself. If you have a penis, you are a man. If you say that to her, that would be an act of violence. Because you are denying her the right to self-determination. You are denying her the right to claim the gender that she wants to. So if you are um, gender sensitized, you are going to say, doesn't matter if you have a penis. If you say you're a woman, then you are a woman. So if she says that she is a woman and if she has a penis, then does the penis remain a male sexual organ anymore? It doesn't. If the man says that I am a man, but I have a vagina, does the vagina remain a female sexual organ anymore? It doesn't. So therefore, both the penis and the vagina, they still remain excretory organs, yes. They still remain sexual organs, yes. But they do not have sex. The penis is neither male nor female. It assumes the identity that the person's body says it is. So you see, Sex is not biological. Sex is therefore socially constructed in order to help a certain construction of gender, which is based supposedly on a stable body. But I'm incredibly grateful to the huge intervention that has been done by the transgender studies that primarily challenges the notion that the body is stable. The body is not stable. So if the body is not stable, then therefore sex is not stable either. So therefore gender is not stable either. Therefore sexual desire is not stable either. So what we are really looking at therefore is we 
are trained to think about the biological sex as this inviolable, stable ground on which gender can be constructed. But as I have just shown you, biological sex doesn't exist. So if biological sex doesn't exist, then gender as a material substance does not exist. Gender basically becomes fiction. Gender basically because, well, I mean, you know, uh, uh, previously gender was supposed to be thought uh, solid. Now there are some people who are saying gender is fluid. I think gender is gaseous. I think gender is gas. There is no materiality to gender whatsoever. Right? Gender is fiction. But here is the irony of it. A novel exists, a novel by Charles Dickens exists, a play by Shakespeare exists. But just because a novel by Charles Dickens exists, just because a novel by Shakespeare exists does not mean that what happens in the play or what happens in the novel is real. So therefore, fiction is real in the sense that you can actually buy a novel, but it is not real in the sense that it hasn't actually happened in history. It doesn't have any kind of documentation of the events. There is no public register where you are going to find when David Copperfield was born. There's no birth certificate that you are going to find in some church that is going to give you the birth date of David Copperfield. Because David Copperfield exists in fiction. David Copperfield does not exist in life. Gender is a fiction. But this is where it all starts to go completely wrong. This fictionality is something that patriarchy teaches us as the truth. Gender is the lie that we accept as the truth. And it is this acceptance of a lie as the truth which creates endless problems for everybody. Imagine how much easier it would be for a child, anybody, to grow up without being assigned a particular sex without being assigned a particular gender. Once the child was able to make their own decisions, the child could then decide which gender the child wishes to perform or indeed the child may decide to perform no gender at all because there are people who now identify as a gender. Then there are other people who identify as gender queer. Right? There are other people who identify as gender non-conforming. Then there are other people who identify as trans person. So you're neither a trans man nor are you a trans woman. So there are all of these variations that are available to us. But patriarchy is extremely uncomfortable with these variations that are available. So therefore what patriarchy will say is decide, do you want to be a man or do you want to be a woman? This particular pressure that is brought to bear on all of us, decide whether you want to be this, decide you want to be that, that pressure, please understand, is violence. It is the same violence that parents perform on their children when they decide that I have given birth to a son or I have given birth to a daughter. No, you have not. You have given birth to a homo sapien. 
neither boy nor girl, neither male nor female, whether the child is going to eventually grow up to be a man or a woman, leave that to the child. But that is something that parents will not do. And what is worse is that once the child has been gendered, once the child has been sexed, then of course comes the third step. The child has to be sexualized. The pressure will be brought to bear upon the child to get married because until you are married, you are, your gender is still not quite stable. Being a man isn't enough. You have to be a husband. Being a woman isn't enough. You have to be a wife. And if you think that is enough, no, because being a man is not enough. Being a husband is not enough. You have to be a father. Being a woman is not enough. Being a wife is not enough. You have to be a mother. So therefore, parenthood is then added to the structure of gender in order to further consolidate it. So it is these layers that are brought to bear upon the body based on that which lies between our legs to create this enormous structure that many of us are being suffocated by. Now, in the, the next few minutes that I have before I'm going to conclude and I'm going to take some questions, let me also tell you that gender is not simply and uniquely constructed along the lines of sex or sexuality. There are other contributory factors that take away your gender or give you gender. Race. Yes, many of us are familiar with the idea that the colonizer, those of us who are familiar with post-colonial studies, you will know this anyway. The colonizer is gendered male. The colonized is gendered female. So it does not matter whether the colonized nation has got men or women. In the eyes of the colonizer, everybody is feminized. Right. Also, if you look at the way in which um, one religion regards another religion, the religion that is assuming the subject position will always claim masculinity for itself. Always. A particular caste will claim masculinity for itself. A particular um, class is going to claim masculinity for itself. So therefore, there is a way in which gender is aligned to the binary of the subject and the object. The object is invariably feminized, irrespective of the genitalia. And the subject is masculinized, irrespective of the genitalia. So therefore, there is a way in which gender is produced, the way in which gender functions, not just on the basis of the corporeal body, not just on the material body, not just on genitalia, but it is actually informed by other structures of oppression, such as race, class, caste, religion, etc., etc. So feminism uh, way back, and this is something which I think many of us should be aware of, is that even in the 1970s, even in the 1970s, in 1977, there were some feminists who were already beginning to say that feminism cannot possibly succeed if it does not include men too. Feminism cannot succeed if it does not include other races, 
feminism cannot succeed if it does not include other classes. So even in the 1970s, there were some feminists who were already talking about intersectional intersectionality. It isn't something that happened yesterday. It was already being talked about in the 1970s. So now what we really have to understand is that what is gender is that it is an extremely toxic. People talk about toxic masculinity. If you're saying that toxic masculinity exists, then you also have to talk about um, you know, toxic femininity. Or are we going to say that femininity can never be toxic, that only masculinity can be toxic? What we really have to understand is that gender itself is potentially toxic. And how does it become toxic? It becomes toxic when gender becomes normative, when gender becomes a rule, when gender becomes prescriptive. And maybe the time has come for us to move away from a prescriptive normative understanding of gender that is exclusively predicated on the material body, on genitalia. And maybe we should understand gender as a floating signifier. Anybody can be any gender. And of course, literature, culture, society, law, public institutions, they will all have to acknowledge this. And maybe then we will be able to understand better gender just as a performance and not as performative. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot for this wonderful presentation. And so the questions, so many questions are there and not sure how many I will also be able to pick. So Which is why I only took uh, about 45 minutes. Yes, yes. So the first question is that. Yes. As colonized and colonizer, do you think the yeah. lit body is also feminized by Brahminical capitalism? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is what I said, is that the subject position always remains male. Uh, the subject position always remains masculine. So anybody who is in power will always claim a certain discursive masculinity, which of course doesn't exist, but there is a certain kind of discursive masculinity, which is discursively produced, is produced purely through words. That will be claimed. So yes, it isn't just about, it. it is about any structure of oppression. It can be colonialism, it can be capitalism, it can be casteism, it can be classism, all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. How would you link the construction of the sequence? Desire, gender, sex, and Freud's theme of psychoanalysis, which is based on the sexual desire of a child or a newborn baby? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, um, I, I think, well, I mean, you know, Freud has been very, very severely criticized for his unconscious patriarchy, right? You know that, many people know that. Um, Judith Butler, in her second chapter of Gender Trouble, has very clearly exposed uh, Freud's um, sort of unconscious investment in heterosexuality. Um, and also every time, I, I think, you know, every time we think about Freud uh, and the way in which we think about the mother and the father, um, maybe the time has come for us to stop thinking about the child as always already having a mother and a father. So therefore, how would I apply Freudian psychoanalytic uh, paradigm to an orphan who has been found on the roadside and who has grown up in an orphanage? Where is the father figure there? Where is the mother figure there? Right? Where would one find Freud if today we are going to see an increasingly large numbers of, of lesbians uh, who are raising children very, very successfully, 
um, happy, well-adjusted, brilliant, radiant children. How will Freud fit into that? How will Freud fit into um, the two gay men who are raising their child? So therefore, I think maybe we should try to um, not worship Freud too religiously. Uh, there are certain things that he said that I'm sure um, are, are relevant, but maybe we should stop following Freud slavishly because the kind of a family structure that Freud was thinking is very, very fast disappearing. Um, so Freud's construction of gender is something that very soon is going to become outmoded. So the next question is, how can the feminist movement, with its emphasis on material categories of identity, reconcile itself with with word theory, which destabilize identity? Right. Um, I think this is an extremely spurious um, kind of opposition that some people uh, are hell-bent on creating between feminism and queer theory. It is a spurious opposition. Because one must understand that without feminism, there would be no queer theory. Queer theory is heavily, heavily feminist. The only thing that one has to remember is that queer theory is feminism in a post-structuralist way. Feminism is no longer um, kind of as invested in materiality as it used to be. Feminism has now begun to understand that language is a floating signifier. So therefore there is absolutely, and I'm very, very disappointed that, that even um, people like uh, Germaine Greer, um, you know, and there are many, many other feminists who are now openly uh, openly opposing um, the lesbian identity they are openly opposing um, the identity of the trans woman um, so therefore um, i i am appalled by the kind of transphobia that i am noticing in some feminists which i think is is just inconceivable uh, for for a post structuralist feminist like me so therefore, there is no opposition between feminism and queer theory. Um, there is certainly, uh, there is, it's, it's a continuum. There is no opposition. Um, a post-structuralist feminism is absolutely um, the energy which vivifies queer theory. So the next question is, sir, the stark reality is that a majority of women doesn't have access to education and that makes them unaware of their basic rights, much less their productive rights. What could be the suitable way to make them avail the rights that they deserve and what will be the role, role of men in this country? It isn't just the role of the man. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, irrespective, you know, I, I think it is again a kind of, um, it is kind of essentialist to somehow believe that all men are somehow responsible for this. Um, so I think what I would really say is that irrespective of man or woman, I think that uh, wherever the child is growing up, either with one's birth parents or with one's um, adoptive parents, um, wherever the child is growing up, um, the child should be educated irrespective of the gender that the child has. Um, and um, so, so, I mean, that is the only thing that I think can be can be done about it. And I think one has to one has to come to a realization that a woman's job in society is not to just to reproduce women should not be thought of as just the uterus um, and i think the sooner we understand that the better it is going to be but i don't know when that is going to happen because unfortunately we live in a society where marriage is still um, given the kind of obscene importance which it doesn't deserve so i think there needs to be an overhaul of the way in which we think about reproduction before we can acknowledge that that women are not just the uterus um, women uh, have every right to education that those people with penis have. Okay. 
that uh, if ideas are changing you are telling then what about the ideology that clear sorry if ideas are changing then what about the ideology patriarchy means to you ah very good question um <laughs> patriarchy is a constantly mutating drug resistant virus right so patriarchy is constantly mutating you see feminine think about feminists as those people who are sitting in labs trying to discover a cure to coronavirus only replace coronavirus with patriarchy virus same thing right so therefore feminists are trying to discover new ways of combating patriarchy but patriarchy also has a way of mutating um in ways that somehow um people don't recognize they think that patriarchy is over but it isn't over so therefore what we really have to understand is that patriarchy will continue to mutate it will never go away well i mean i hope it goes away but it's not <laughs> happening by next week um so patriarchy will constantly mutate but feminists are constantly going to try to um discover a vaccine for it feminists are going to constantly try to discover a cure for it uh, and some of the uh, and some of those vaccines and cures have paid off which is why women have the right to vote which is why women can uh, you know hold positions of power that they previously didn't so feminism has made a huge change but i think feminism also has to take on the case of those who are neither men nor women because uh, to constantly think in terms of gender binary is going to be ultimately harmful to feminism uh, but but we are getting there we are talking about it research is on for the next next vaccine to patriarchy virus <laughs> do you think stability somewhat intrigued the gender differentiation and do you think that normative social structure somewhat determine the sex of a person and how can we deconstruct such norms we can deconstruct such norms by basically insisting that when the child is born we are not going to declare the child male or female let us start there the rest will follow the child should be allowed to decide whether the child wishes to have a particular gender or not and it should not be dumped on the child the child should be allowed to choose their gender in the same way that we um, at least some good parents allow their children to choose what they wish to study or uh, choose who they wish to marry if you have the freedom to choose which subject you want to study you should also have the right to choose which gender you want to be it should not be decided for you now that's very interesting question it is telling that in some rural areas of murshidabad and bardwan a popular <laughs> folk dance named bolan is performed on the occasion of gajol where the male performer often take the guise of a female does mm. this instance of travestism or mm. drug help in blurring the gender binary of male and female no unfortunately it doesn't well i mean it is not just that tradition you know um the i will be talking about the book that i co-edited with um, the late professor tutun mukherjee called nari bhav that entire book documents many 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 instances of men who are dressing up as women or performing at various religious festivals um so that is by no means an isolated instance um it happens across cultures it happens across centuries i don't think that that destabilizes identity at all because um you know in a very strange way um you know um those are gender transgressions that are performed under very strict terms and conditions right so therefore under certain terms and conditions you are allowed to digress but once those transitions transgressions are over you are then expected to come back to the normal right so therefore this is very much the way in which um 
you know, um, the way in which um, Bakhtin um, theorizes, you know, um, I'm forgetting the name of the term, it's, it comes to me now, um, where, where you are allowed to transgress power, you are allowed to make fun of power, but under certain strict terms and conditions. But After that period is carnivalesque, exactly. So yeah. therefore, so that is what it is, is that carnivalesque is, is a kind of, um, you are permitted to transgress, but for a limited period. So therefore, if you're trans permitted to, to transgress for a limited period, that is, is no transgression at all. It should apply throughout the person's life. Only then can gender binaries be, uh, uh, you know, challenged. Okay. So can we ascribe gender to materialism? Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not terribly sure how that question, I mean, I, I don't quite understand the question, but uh, but gender uh, does not have a materiality, but material culture will constantly try to create um, the illusion of gender. That is what material culture constantly tries to do. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't quite understand your question, uh, but, um, but gender has no materiality. That is the whole point. It doesn't have a materiality, but material culture will constantly to uh, constantly try to pretend that that kind of materiality is there. Uh, how is gender played out in the context of matriarchal societies? Hello. Hello, sir. I'm audible. Sorry for the technical glitches. Yes. Uh, yes. Sir. Hello. Ah, sir. Hello. Yes. Um, I think I lost you for a bit there. So. Yes. Sir. Yes. So, uh, are there no more questions? Sir, there are only one question. Okay, well, only one question. That's very good. Very well timed. No, sir. There are so many questions, sir. But because of time constraint, I'm unable to ask you. But sir, there are so that many questions. Fine. Oh, okay, right. Uh, yes. In order to deconstruct the concept of gender, we need to acknowledge its existence by calling it fiction. How will we effectively diffuse the concept of gender itself? Um, precisely by calling it fiction <laughs> is if you call it, uh, that is how you do it. Um, um, you see, when we, uh, you know, we acknowledge that Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck are fictional characters, right? So we are not going to say that Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck don't exist. Of course they exist, but they exist as fiction. That is what we should do about gender as well, is that we should acknowledge that gender is fiction. It exists as a story. It exists as, as Judith Butler says, as, as a foundationalist fable. That is her phrase, fable, right? So, so fabula. So therefore, that is something that is invented. Gender is an invention. It, it, is, it, is, it is a creative act. Um, it has no material reality whatsoever. Okay. So sir, it's about that differentiating between sex, gender, and sexual orientation uh, yes. can be taken as one of the uh, first step to a deeper understanding and, and critical analysis of, of, of all these issues. And sir, understanding yes. the sociology of sex, gender, and sexuality we, will certainly help to build a, a certain kind of awareness of inequalities experienced by subordinate groups such as women, homosexuals, transgendered individuals. So, sir, I would like to propose a hearty vote of thanks to you for gracing you. today's evening in this illustrious way and delivering today's inaugural address. Thank you, Thank sir, you so for much. Very interesting and thought provoking.
address and i'm sure that all the participants have taken note of your suggestions observations and ideas and i'm sure that they will be discussing within their organization the action to be initiated at their very level and they will strive to question the way society perceives and experiences sex gender and sexuality opening the door to a new scholarly understanding thanks a lot sir thank you so much thank you thank you now i'm going to um, start the second session with dr tania hawk and before that hi adu there hello tania ji are you there wait for a bit technical glitches hello tania ji yes so it's uh, something like that uh, yes 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 uh, No, you are sharing your screen uh, you are sharing your screen actually uh, but uh, this is not uh, the way you have to close it yes 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 please close the screen you are not audible also please unmute yourself yes ah and you are sharing the screen it's not showing the uh, slides it's not showing the slides uh so many screens are there why i don't know ah that 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 is why you have to close this um, stop sharing you have to stop share the, your screen at first okay stop sharing okay then okay. let me first welcome you and um, <laughs> okay. so now we are going to welcome dr tania hawk who is the professor in the department of women and gender studies university of dhaka and graduated in public administration from dhaka university and she also obtained her first ma degree in public administration from the same university she was nominated by the department under a dutch fellowship to study at the institute of social studies iss at the then from where she received her second masters degree she has completed her ma in development studies specialization in women gender and development at the institute of social studies the ha the nidal had research work for masters program focused on the redistribution of work in the family she served as the chair of the department of women and gender studies from april 2012 to april 2015 she has achieved her phd degree from university of dhaka the title of her thesis was unpaid care work with recognition or redistribution she has several publication to her credit her, her areas of interest include care economy violence against women feminization of poverty and empowerment and dr tania has been nominated as a member of south asian association for regional cooperation as secretariat for the term 2015 to 2018 and today she will tell us about exploring the uncounted contribution of women in bangladesh situational analysis during covid-19 we have already saw the glimpses of this kind of presentation and today uh, we will again going to be enriched by the presentation of dr tanya now please the stage is called uh actually good evening uh, everyone first of all i am grateful to the women's cell and the department of english of btm college for organizing this international platform on gender sensitization Special thanks goes to Mr. Gautam for inviting me as a as a speaker, and finally, I'm really grateful to our honourable audience and guests who are going to be part of this event. So, welcome to my session. Now, I want to share with you. Uh, how can I do it? Share a screen. Yes, Gautam? yeah. You have to you have to open the slide in the background. Ah, uh, okay. You have to open the slide in the background.
yes stay there stay with us we are going to resume soon no 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 you have to click on share screen and then you have to click on application window application window okay then then you have to click on application window and then okay. you have to click on that slide and then share application window your personal presentation you have to click and then also click share personal presentation agenda this one i can do and then share you have to click share yes it is there yes it is there now you can start yes absolutely fine mm. yes it's perfectly audio no 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 don't no need to shrink it make it full screen make it full screen acha acha okay hmm. yes it's perfectly okay now okay now yes 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 i'm i'm okay yes So welcome to my session. The title of my session is Exploring Unpaid Care Work in Bangladesh: Situation and Analysis During COVID-19. Actually, this year marked the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action, and was uh, intended to be groundbreaking for gender equality. But with the outbreak of COVID-19, the success achieved in the field of gender equality might take backward steps. day by day this pandemic is magnifying existing inequalities and exposing vulnerabilities in social political and economic systems this paradox is equally stark within households what is unpaid care work in bangladesh the perception towards unpaid care work and work and worker these are totally gendered this perception commonly commonly exists not only in men but also in women also in bangladesh unpaid care work is practically synonymous with women's work there is a misconception that those who are economically productive do real work and where care work is not considered as real work care work is not essentially attention grabbing because most of the part done by women this is not connected with the public sphere and it is not subject to change through the policy so as a consequence our understanding and position on unpaid care work remains incomplete there is also the societal expectation and pressure that women are the more natural caregivers emotional support providers and multitaskers care work is named as a uh, labor of love or responsibility it is 24 hours job no retirement age and no retirement benefits or pension care work is something which women have inherited and it doesn't receive any remuneration and therefore it is not considered important as much as it is if we look at the historical background where we see that this unpaid care work has been a source of conflict that has divided men and women and social norms regularly weaken 
women's intra-household position by constructing them as dependents, uh, women as dependents and men as universal breadwinner. So moreover, the devolution of domestic labor is built into norms of appropriate femininity and masculinity. So it is more acceptable for women to adopt masculine behavior such as doing paid work in the labor market and it is for men to adopt feminine behavior such as doing unpaid work. So the internalization of an ideology of gender from an early age encourages women to feel that home should come first. And thus women's employment is often an extension of the female domestic role. If we consider the pre-COVID uh, time in Bangladesh, where we see that in Bangladesh pre-COVID period, women on an average perform 3.43 times more domestic work than men. Of the total time spent on the care work, women contribute 89% and men only 11%. Under the presence of United Nations system of national accounts, production boundary definitions, 95% of non-market production is totally excluded. So conventional GDP estimates capture 98% of men's production, but only 47% of women's production. Men have 12% more laser and time to rest than women. If you look at the labor force characteristics, where you will see that there is a huge gender gap between male and female. And that the data clearly stated that there is a gender dimension in the labor market. As a result, uh, we, here uh, the data says that most of the men are playing the productive role. They are the active contributors and women are uh, playing as um, passive, uh, passive recipients or unproductive labor force. On basis of this table, a few questions arise that are women working less than men? Where are they investing their time? So why workers, particularly women workers, are undercounted? Why women's work is invisible? As a result, men receive the lion's share of income and recognition for their economic contribution, while most of the women's work remains unrecognized, underpaid, and undervalued. So we are encouraging uh, women empowerment through employment without sufficient attention that who will go who will uh, do the household chores and who will look after children and elderly and the sick members and who will pay for it. So it has been realized that current set of statistics used to measure work and valuable production are incomplete and consequently misleading. Through this way, men become productive agent and women are reproductive. Considering the uh, COVID crisis, uh, COVID-19, it is definitely one kind of uh, uh, global crisis. But if we consider the situation of home, home is another shadow pandemic for women only in the context of Bangladesh. COVID-19 is not only a major economic uh, and health shock, it may also be a major shock to social norms around the gender distribution of work at home. The home has emerged as the site of what has been called the shadow pandemic, an increase in the numbers of women experiencing domestic violence in one side and, and a burden of work, unpaid care work on the other side. Most of the women are negotiating with the outside job, but they have no options of negotiation with unpaid care work. So COVID-19, it is re-traditionalizing our care work. Uh, if we consider the worldwide picture, it says that 191 countries have implemented nationwide school closures in an attempt to prevent further um, uh, continuing uh, impacting over 91% of world's student population. Bangladesh is one of them. According to a recent ILO report, 606 million women of working age say that they were not able to get a paid job because of unpaid care work compared to 41 million men. So on an average, women did three times as much unpaid care work as men at home even before. So now formal sector female employees we, with children are balancing one or more of the following like work, childcare, homeschooling, elder care, and housework. 
on average, women uh, are ready to spend some more time providing care as well as educational support to children. Older people are at great, greater risk of falling severely ill if infected by COVID-19. Women will shoulder the responsibility of caring for them. It includes caring for the disabled, those with long-term health problems and demographic changes. It is one point which I want to add here that for the sake of demographic changes in Bangladesh by 2035, there will be a sizable aging population, which means the demand and need for unpaid care work will increase. Since women bear responsibility for social reproduction during crisis, they are facing increased pressure to substitute unpaid work for lost income, for example, taking care of an ill relative at home rather than taking them to a clinic. The negative implications of the lack of laser time reduce women and girls' well-being. Due to economic and ecological crisis, women's unpaid labor acts as a stabilizer and automatically their burden increases. So we can say that there is a broad range of economic and non-economic costs are connected bearing unpaid care work. There are, there are multiple uh, sectors, multiple costs women are bearing due to these unpaid care responsibilities. Considering one, physical cost with women health and social care workers already facing higher infection rates, thus danger to their physical well-being. And most of the women, those who are uh, preoccupied and occupied for the sake of unpaid care work, they are always suffering from the time crisis and emotional costs also they are bearing. That means uh, that caregivers have been found their sentiments over their loss of independence and control over access and choices. They are also bearing the social costs. Most of the caregivers forego their social, laser, and personal development activities. Unpaid care work, definitely it is one kind of contextual issue. We need to remember that all women are not equal contributors uh, in Bangladesh. It depends on class, number of children, their age, type of family, geographical location, type of job they are doing, and type of helping hand they do have. So difference in reality brings different level of concern of the same problem. There is a class dimension. That means the household uh, situation is not same in the rich, uh, uh, rich family and in the poor family. The wealthiest, uh, the, those who are rich, they can offer more flexible options of support. But in the poorest households, situation is totally different. So unpaid care work, uh, there is a class dimension and there is a dimension of rural urban rural women are spending more time than urban women collecting water fuel lack of gas electricity they are suffering a multiple uh, they are suffering from a multiple problems and issues and there is a uh, issue there is an issue of geographic location also if we consider the unpaid care work the situation Women in conflict zones and living in camps for refugees and displaced people are facing the virus in the worst conditions. Care workers in remote areas are taking different responsibilities. There is an uh, unequal situation between employed and homemaker because employed women are constantly facing practical emotional problems in negotiating the gendered nature of care work nexus. Single parents, they are also suffering in a different way, like female-headed household or any other single parent. They are facing multiple difficulties. So for disabled, transgender, ethnic women's care needs must be prioritized in this section. We need to think this subject in a different way because unpaid work that sustain our families, communities, and whole societies but it has been consistently ignored and taken for granted in public policy and development efforts. This is not about wages for housework, nor about reducing the overall care provided, nor preventing women from making their own choices about when and how to provide care. Our main motive is all citizens should get proper quality of care, but the costs and burden should be more evenly distributed Caregivers should not sacrifice their rights, needs, 
choices, incomes, and opportunity. Actually, care work is definitely work because it has cost both time and energy. Care work is embedded in complex, complex pattern of social relations. Therefore, care work becomes home responsibility rather than the state. The policymakers fail to realize the fact that there is a strong link between the household and the state. The outdated system of counting work and the very definition of work needs to be challenged. We need to stop considering the GDP as a tool for measuring well-being because GDP measures only monetary dealings related to the production of goods and services. Policymakers should consider a new set of indicators prior to creating a policy plan where quantitative and qualitative development will get equal importance. Actually, we are suffering from this COVID crisis, but at the, uh, at the same time, we know we will have to cope with this crisis. So the best option will be uh, 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 if we convert this crisis into opportunities. Actually, we are still fighting hard for gender equality with the uh, coronavirus crisis, amplifying existing inequalities and power imbalances and disproportionately affecting women including in the devastatingly sharp increases in domestic violence. Yet the pandemic is also an opportunity to build back better and transform structural gender inequalities. We need to consider COVID-19 as an opportunity to challenge harmful gender roles and norms as the crisis disrupts and brings to light many of the systematic and structural barriers that have held back the advancement of gender equality. In short, this point time could be a chance to move towards more flexible, inclusive, family-friendly workplaces and a more balanced share of care, family responsibilities between working mothers and working fathers. The crisis has also showcased that we can only overcome the pandemic and build resilience against looming and future emergencies by investing now in further promoting and strengthening human rights, gender equality, and the expansion of human security. Actually, if we consider the academic lens, they have uh, tried to build up a framework through which we can re-justify these unpaid care work. Uh, here, they are claiming triple R framework. That means uh, recognition, reduction, and redistribution. Recognition means acknowledges that unpaid care work is often taken for granted and ignored both in households in wider society. Recognition means taking unpaid care work into account in analysis and policy making, including recognition of social norms, gender stereotypes, and power relations and discourses. And uh, in the case of reduction, uh, which implies reducing the amount of care work through public investment in infrastructure, including transport, water, electricity, gas, cooking stoves in areas where the necessary services and equipments are lacking. Redistribution of care work implies sharing the work between households and society, as well as between women and men. It includes challenging gender stereotypes and norms, provisioning of uh, public child care services for working parents, and tackling gender discrimination at work. Presently, uh, uh, academician and feminists, they have incorporated one uh, significant sphere that is representation is needed for unpaid care work. And that was added to the framework to promote the representation of uh, carers in relevant policy making and developing the capacity of carers so that they can directly include it in decision making process. Actually, the significant point is here that women should learn to define their own problems and their needs. This is uh, the process of recognition, re reduction, and redistribution. Actually, this is the time we will have to take some short-term actions as well as long-term uh, plan-based action. So uh, a gender equal future is everyone's responsibility. So women and care work uh, they remain glaringly absent from the stimulus packages and emergency measures 
it's re really very mm, painful. And this callous neglect is a predictable result of a growth above everything else model of development, compounded by social norms that assign all care responsibilities to women and girls and undervalue it. Government must therefore in, uh, include some social protection measures. Here, the, our government or any other government can take some necessary actions, immediate actions, like affordable health insurance with benefits, emergency cash assistance we can provide to the family, and paid sick leave and family medical leave for those who are able to come to work, and create messaging through uh, social media and mainstream media that promotes sharing of household chores and unpaid care work at home. Actually, we need to legislate to recognize and support unpaid, underpaid carers through national policies. There is no way. Enhance public investment in care infrastructure alongside investment in public service infrastructure. Create women's social enterprises in care work and support the transition of care workers from informal to the formal economy through training, education, and certification. Reduce care work by addressing social norms. Promote equal sharing of care by engaging men through educational systems, ruling out public campaigns, flexible work arrangements to balance work and family commitments. We need to design and implement strategies to address COVID-19 related gender issues that are aligned with the international labor standards to tackle the new challenges posed to the changing world of work. We will have to expand and invest in universal social protection, including effective and affordable access to quality healthcare, as well as immediate income and food support. We will have to design economic recovery packages that recognize and place a value on unpaid care work and care jobs and provide adequate levels of quality care, child care. We will have to ensure that girls are included in learning and skills development programs during and after the crisis. And we need to collect gender related statistics and data to inform crisis response and recovery plans. Actually, this crisis will lay the ground for gender transformative macroeconomic decisions that prioritize social protection and care national budgets that, uh, that are more responsive to the needs and priorities of all women. Globally and domestically generate gender disaggregated data that can help, uh, help countries devise gender responsive policies interventions. Adjustment to existing social and labor protection systems to ensure that all workers regardless of their contractual status are afforded adequate labor and social protection and the presence of more women in decision-making positions. Actually, without an intersectional lens, we cannot truly provide a gender-informed COVID-19 response that considers all needs of women in lower resource settings in Bangladesh. Because we will have to remember here that women and men are not a homogeneous group. So their needs, their requirements, their situation uh, all things uh, are, uh, dif uh, differ from one woman to another. So we have already seen that adopting a one-size-fits-all approach to tackling this crisis will result in a failure for the most marginalized groups. And new commitments toward the equal sharing of care work need to be resourced, implemented, and monitored thoroughly. Government must work to reduce the burden of unpaid care work through the provision of public services, infrastructure, and child child care centers. There have many things to learn from this COVID crisis, you know. Actually, while COVID-19 has undoubtedly exposed the injustices in our societies and economies, it has also opened up the possibilities to shift to a more resilient and caring economy. Change is not only required at the policy formation level, but also in terms of the approaches adopted at the policy implementation level. We need to shift our focus from who gets what to what people need actually. In a welfare state, policymakers should consider the following indicators prior to creating a policy plan. Respect for human well-being, 
and rights are not optional in development. Actually, we are passing through an extraordinary time and this extraordinary time requires extraordinary solidarity. So considering this uh, issue, this challenging moment is not only a call to protect, protect people's lives and preserve their rights. It is also an opportunity to face our common failures, learn from them and build a better, more gender equal world that is healthier, more prosperous and more peaceful. All actors need to work for a significant increase in investment to close the gender gap. As part of the commitments in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, all the more important as we face the battle against COVID-19. It is uh, that the pandemic has forced us to rethink our priorities. This extraordinary time requires extraordinary humanistic leadership, free from phobia, sexism, and economic mercantilism. It requires everybody's action, people of all genders, public and civil society sector. Our humanity must light up these darkest times. So thank you, everyone. And uh, before ending my session and lecture, I would like to address this um, uh, where women uh, are saying that if women stop, the world stops. This is one kind of women's global strike. So thank you everyone for listening my lecture. Yes. Where should I go? Yes, 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 you are here. Okay, okay. Uh, 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 no, no. Uh -huh. no, it's okay, okay. You are here now, huh? It's okay. Okay. Hmm. Uh -huh. okay, now let me ask you a few questions. Yes, you told that um, about single fathers. So how do we understand the care work undertaken by single fathers? Sorry? How do we understand the care work undertaken by single fathers? It is situational and context oriented because uh, there could be par single parent, like uh, a father or mother, anyone. So uh, when uh, one person is taking the responsibilities of parenting, so uh, it would be very difficult for, uh, for, if, uh, for a father or a mother. So I'm emphasizing that point of view. Okay. okay. Uh, pertaining to the care crisis scenario in Bangladesh, what mm -hmm. is the position of paid care work in Bangladesh? Uh, actually, it is a... Uh, current issue which we are trying to bring on the table uh, that uh, actually you know that uh, after 1980 people uh, women started working in the labor market and after that uh, two decades uh, three decades already gone within this time we have started realizing that women need uh, a daycare center for their ch children to continue their uh, labor market work so uh, considering this uh, issue government and uh, NGOs, some NGOs and some organizations, uh, they have started taking this responsibility. They have introducing, establishing some daycare centers, but uh, not in a regular way. All organizations, they do not have the daycare center. So they are not providing this, uh, 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 what should I say, uh, this support uh, from uh, their uh, perspective. Why it is important to take gender concerns into account in program design and uh, implantation? Definitely, gender is everywhere. We do not know who is producing gender, but we can see gender is everywhere. And there is a gender dimension in every aspect of our life. So if we do not consider this issue in the process of planning and the rest of the things, 
uh, then gender biasness will increase a lot. So definitely we will have to consider our gender lens for preparing any kind of policy plan or any kind of development, uh, uh, yes, uh, process. Gender, must, gender lens must be there, not gender. Gender dimension, dimension wise, we will try to produce our plan and policies. What should be the role of men in this context when women are now suffering due to this pandemic? What should be the role of men who are working in the private sectors and what should be the role of men who are working in the government sector? Is there any change in their mindset during this pandemic? Actually, I don't have the exact uh, information, but from my realization, I can say that uh, Definitely, men and women both have the same role for their family life. Uh, but uh, it is a hidden or missing issue in the development process. Um, actually, men and when men are uh, in some uh, families and households, we are uh, realizing that men started working and uh, sharing the household chores. But in most of the cases, women are taking the sole responsibility of household activities and the problem is where you know that it is not the problem of patriarchy it's a problem of classic patriarchy because most of the women also think they have inherited that uh, this is this is her own she is supposed to play this role uh, as a mother as a wife and uh, something like this so uh... Do you think that um, this kind of COVID-19 situation and in this um, pandemic situation, um, the relationship between men and women are getting worse day by day in Bangladesh or in Not other South Asian all. countries? Uh, I said uh, the issue is contextual. It is context oriented. It differs uh, person to person and situation to situation, family to family. Uh, we cannot say exactly that all people are doing the same thing. So uh, we will have to realize, we will have to know the actual picture. At the end of this post-COVID uh, uh, period, we will have to do a large volume of research work through which we will have to investigate the reality, multi-layers of realities in our society. On basis of that particular research work, we can claim something, not before that. Okay. Mm. What should be the role of uh, um, transgender people or uh, uh, what will be the condition of the prostitutes also in this context in during this COVID-19? Are the governments um, taking sufficient step to, to give them also that kind of protection in this COVID-19? Actually, the um, transgender, disabled body, uh, ethnic women, they are totally, I will never say that they are sidelined and ignored by the government policy and activities, but yes, little bit uh, they are sidelined in some circumstances. But uh, those who are working on this particular issue of transgender, on transgender and ethnic uh, people, and as well as the disabled people, they are trying to bring this issue on the table and focusing that what kind of uh, requirements uh, they need and they can, uh, on basis of that government can fulfill their uh, uh, life process and everything. This is definitely one kind of ignored issue, issue uh, but uh, 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 nowadays we have started realizing that uh, gender is a cross-cutting issue. So we cannot ignore uh, transgender, uh, ethnic women and disabled people uh, very easily. We have started realizing this. Okay. Okay. So at the same time, um, it is telling that uh, while life saving the COVID-19 lockdown is uh, disproportionately impacting women also as ex uh, existing gender equalities are um, excavating gender-based disparities between women, men, girls and boys in terms of access in information resources to cope with the pandemic and its socio-economic impact. It is therefore essential to undertake a gendered impact analysis of COVID-19. So, uh, do you think that this COVID-19 can be um, can be explicated uh, from a uh, 
gender neutral point of view also or uh, how the how the gender based violence can be reduced down in this covid 19 in bangladesh also that kind of gender based violence how can be it reduced In this uh, after situation. COVID nineteen, how can we reduce gender-based violence? Are you asking yes. like that? Yes. Actually, gender-based violence is an ongoing process. Activities in our society, uh, it's a continuous process. Like uh, we cannot say that after after post COVID time, people will change their mind, their traditional mindset. Uh, we can convert them. Uh, you know, in a very positive way uh, this is a big challenge for us you know uh, so uh, time will say uh, we cannot claim anything exactly at this moment okay. at the same time there is another question that uh, do you really think that uh, unemployment economic and livelihood impacts for the poor women and girls more severely during this condition definitely definitely no one will disagree with this question oh, okay okay poor people poor women poor girls they are suffering in a different way there is no comparison with with the rich and poor there is a huge gap so they are suffering in a different way in the case of fulfilling their basic needs um and rest of the things Uh, which uh, is possible for the rich people very easily they can achieve anything which is not possible for the poor people so situation different yes um, i also think that women and girls voices are not being included to inform a gender targeted response this is particularly the case for most left uh, left behind so don't you think that policy response mechanism do not incorporate gender analysis data or gender responsive plans they should incorporate the uh, gender responsive plans um, to understand the nuances of the various kind of issues pertaining to gender in this condition the policy should be changed or should be modified accordingly i'm sorry gotham is that your question <laughs> or any answer <laughs> no it, it, it is question. it's a kind of no, no it's a kind of observation and and also you can also <laughs> some <laughs> put for uh, your observation this is with the next disaggregated data which i feel uh which can uh prepare a good uh, scenario and good picture real picture which i believe okay so uh, at the say uh, how are you comparing the condition of uh, bangladeshi women in 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 relation to uh, pakistan um, nepal bhutan and india do you think that yes more or less south asian women are uh, and south asian men also are facing almost same kind of problem because we are more or less located to the same uh, or to some extent that geographical boundary which uh, has um, some similarity or something in common so do you think there is some kind of commonality between uh, south asian countries in this context actually inequality is more than a gender issue so there have multiple variables which uh, mainly Uh, uh, increases uh, gender unequal situation, unequal situation between men and women. Uh, mm, no, I will never. Uh, I cannot say that the scenario context all are uh, at the uh, comparing with Nepal, Bangladesh, and whatever you say, Pakistan. Yeah. It differs uh, context to context. So uh, there is not. Uh, there is no. similar picture some uh, some points or some sectors could be but uh, most of the uh, cases like uh, employment opportunity livelihood household structure in case of unpaid care work it differs it is very much context oriented whatever i said whatever i try to uh, 
uh, I pointed out through my lecture uh, that uh, unpaid care work, the volume of work is also context oriented. All women are not equal contributors. It depends on class. It depends on how many children you have and their age and uh, rest of the things. Okay, okay. So it's a wonderful presentation. And uh, um, before uh, giving you the formal vote of thanks, let me also um, share my observation that uh, uh, indeed, with uh, when the numbers are th um, uh, morning daily, increasing daily, COVID 19 is already having significant and uh, disproportionate effect on Indian as well as Bangladeshi women, men and transgender in general. And while the new coronavirus infection spares no one, its socio-economical impact exposes the long-standing discrimination that women and girls face at home and in the economy only. And recently, I have come across an article that mentioned that the poorest are hit hardest, including migrants, and even women has also engaged enterprises like um, up relief services together with Kupaps and um, uh, Tanya Ji will also come to know about it, that, that Bangladesh Nari Shromik Kendra is there, Bangladesh Women Workers Center and an organization supporting migrant and domestic workers also, yeah. even women use uh, crowdfunding also to raise funds and distributed groceries and cooked meals for 300 migrant uh, women and domestic workers. So Bangladesh is doing great and Bangladesh can be the model for many other countries who are trying to cope up with the situation. Exactly. Thanks, for, thanks for this wonderful talk. And to be honest, your talk can encourage so many kind-hearted people and social workers to set up a gender, gender monitoring network of civil society organizations to whom one can reach out at um, regular intervals to gather information uh, on the challenges that women are facing so that they can channel their voices to policy makers. So thanks a lot for making us aware of welcome. all these facts. And I hope that you will again respond to my call for the sake of academic fraternity and bonding. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Now I'm going to uh, introduce the last speaker of our session and this is none other than Dr. Bonnie Zade, uh, who is an associate professor at the Department of Women's and Gender Studies and Sociology, Virginia Tech University. And her research focuses on discourses of identity, feminism, and activism in contemporary India and South Asian women's fiction. That is, articles have appeared in Women's Studies, International Forum, International Journal of Cultural Studies, and the Journal of Common Law Literature, among others. She is the founder of the Keep Girls in School Project, which has been supporting low-income girls in Telangana and Andhra Pradesh since 2008. And in addition, her work on U.S. rural women prisoners with lead author, Susan Dewey, uh, is Outlaw Women, Prison, uh, Rural Violence and Poverty on the New American Frontier, published by N NYU Press, June 2019. And today she will speak on Begin with Girls, the Need to Energize and Educate Vulnerable vulnerable Adolescents. The stage is all yours, my professor. Please Thank you very on. much. I'm going to share my screen. I have a few slides, and then I'll also um, go back and forth between slides and speaking to you all. Oh. Will I tell you how to share the slide or you? Um, I think I am getting there. Just give me one moment. Oh, sorry, it takes a, a moment because apparently I have to do something with system preferences. <laughs> Didn't realize there was a privacy. Okay.
welcome she is there and very soon she will resume her talk and i am requesting all the participants to be here as i will share the assignment links here only because it is not possible for me to create the links individually and to telegram and other whatsapp groups so i am just requesting all to be here till the end um to get the uh, assignment links also and i am also requesting you submit it within 10 days yes you are <laughs> Okay, I'm st I'm still working on it. I think I may I may be successful this time and not make myself disappear. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a magic trick. <laughs> Can you see it now? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, it is there. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So, greetings everyone. I want to thank um the coordinators. I want to thank Gautam I think you must be an energy powerhouse because you have organized <laughs> you and your colleagues have organized a 7-day webinar that is such an and undertaking it's truly impressive and I'm very excited to be with you all um in Purulia West Bengal even though I've not been there physically this is the closest I've gotten to that place and of course to Jharkhand so I'm pretty excited um I want to share with you this slide which shows my university Virginia Tech. We are located in the mountains in Virginia. We're about 4 and a half hours drive from Washington DC. I think it's important that I tell you I'm speaking on university land that belongs to someone else. It belongs to a native tribe, the Monacan Nation, one of the five original tribes of Virginia. And although I tell you that this land was stolen, to say that is not enough. I recognize that my position is just an accident of birth that I could be speaking to you in this way, and I continue to believe we need to immerse ourselves and act on the change we read and write about. And just okay. <clears throat> My experience in total has included yearly stays in India since 2002, sometimes twice a year, over 18 visits. And I'm just making sure Gautam's not uh, uh, okay. He's not texting me. Okay. Um, and I have taken two sabbaticals and in India, and my work in India combines teaching, service, and research. You notice my title is begin with girls. It's actually hard for me to think about not beginning with girls when we think about the liberation and equality of women because after all girls are our future. And I wanted to start by giving you a sense of girlhood studies as a field. I'll pause here because I have this outline for you. After I tell you a little bit about girlhood studies, We'll move on to my study of a organization that is headquartered in Hyderabad, Voice for Girls. Um, I was able to be with them for a month, and uh, I'll tell you about my methods and the questions I asked of this em empowerment camp for girls, for basically seventh standard girls. I'll talk about the camp's keys to success, which include scaffolded learning, teachers as sisters, a localized curriculum. and activity based learning i asked the campers what lessons do they value the most and what do they act on and i'll tell you what i learned i'll tell you what camps can and can't do and then finally in the last few minutes talk to you about a visiting american college student perspective on this kind of empowerment work okay so girlhood studies First I'd like to recommend to you if you're interested in this topic uh a an article called Charting Girlhood Studies by Claudia Mitchell and that's available in an ebook called Girlhood and the Politics of Place and it's from 2016. If we go back in time one of the classic and important moments in this in in the run up to establishing this field was Carol Gilligan's book in a different voice psychological theory and women's development 
what she did was she challenged psychological theory that suggested that girls are morally weaker than boys. Studying 100 girls, she watched them make decisions and she learned that girls make moral decisions not on the basis of rules, but on the basis of relationship building to cultivate relationships. And um, that is what I believe is, is most important about thinking through uh, a, 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 an important moment in time when it was recognized that it depends on how you define morality. If the, the gender that is common, commonly considered lesser can rise to that standard. And so she basically said to prioritize caring and relationship cultivation over rule following doesn't make a person have weaker morality. So this began this growing rise to revalue instead of devalue girls' activities and practices. And I think back to Janice Radway's 1984 book, Reading the Romance, which helped us understand that women were exercising agency and power with their reading choices. They weren't just gullible consumers. Um, and then moving forward to the early and mid 90s, we can think about how there were many studies that came out, and this is all from a North American perspective. There are other ways to map girlhood studies, but I'm giving you a North American perspective. But moving into the early and the mid 90s, we can think about how we started to study why girls' self-esteem and self-concept absolutely plummets, goes down uh, at the age of 13 or 14. And so does their academic ability or their confidence and ability in male-dominated fields such as math and science. And so we were looking into that connection and thinking about how this emphasis on girls as sexual beings and as um, ornaments or decorative, um, you know, as, as their looks rather than their brains, um, really reinforced in their minds that they had little to offer. And one of the famous texts from that period was Reviving Ophelia by Mary Louise Piper, P-I-P-H-E-R from 1994. So jumping ahead to today, we can think about how um, digital media spaces both offer a unfortunately toxic environment often for girls, but also provide expansive possibilities for hearing from girls themselves. In this participatory and DIY culture that we have now, we can really chart or track the project of girlhood studies as seen through girls' eyes. TikTok, um, many other, uh, Instagram, you name it, right? We can really start to hear searing critiques of racism and sexism coming from some of our younger, youngest members of the community. And as an aside, I predict a 15-year-old's recent video influenced, I'm sorry, in, um, released on July 20th. So just a few days ago, a very important video came out. It's called The Truth About My Abortion. It's released by a girl who had an abortion at age 13 and a half. And she was forced to talk about it because she's famous throughout the country for doing lots of songs and dances on uh, Instagram and someone leaked the information that she had had an abortion. The truth about my abortion is a really unusual video. You can find it on YouTube and I recommend you do. I predict it will subtly change the minds of many girls who are, in my country, who are, are either against abortion or who are uncertain about abortion because this girl is so clearly young and she's talking about how she didn't know um, that she would get pregnant and that she actually was against abortion, but she felt that she wouldn't make a good parent. And I'm just mentioning it to you because I think it's an example of how it's impossible not to remember this video once you see it. And those kinds of interventions, rather than simply interventions from scholars or adult activists, are also what is really powerfully going to change our future. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to 
thinking about the work of Voice for Girls. And I wanna say that I'm not um, claiming to represent the work in its entirety. And I recommend that you contact Voice for Girls themselves um, and maybe even have a staff member from there talk to you about the work to really truly understand it. So let me begin with a story as a preview. Um, I want you to picture walking into a very tiny place um, in Telangana, where shoes are eagerly slipped off and a group of eighth standard campers walk into the classroom. As the girls sit in a circle, the camp counselor, a poised college student from the faraway capital city, reminds them of the meaning of the English word affirmation, a positive statement. Then she says, today's affirmation is, I have a voice. It begins as a group whisper, and then gradually 60 girls grow to a full on collective yell. I have a voice. The instructor pauses and waits for the girls to settle. And then she writes a chart on the blackboard. The girls form teams and then compete to answer true or false questions. Camp counselor says, true or false. A girl can have babies after she gets her first period. This is obviously true, but the girls have to talk about it and figure it out. Rapidly, they say, this is false. The camper says, oh no, she can only have babies after marriage. The counselor gently corrects them, telling them of the biological facts. She then goes on to the next statement, true or false, sex and gender are the same. This time the team is correct and says false. The girl says, the body is sex, but having a wedding custom is gender. Counselor says, good. True or false? It's okay for a husband to beat his wife if she doesn't listen to him. There is some nervous laughter. I hear yeses and noes. Soon the noes get louder. Sister, wife is an independent being, no? Wife is a separate person. The counselor nods, saying yes. Marriage doesn't mean husband has authority over wife. Both are equal. Remember how we learned about negotiation? How to solve problems? Cool down, think, and listen to all possible solutions. We campers respect each other inside the camp, and we listen to each other, right? That's how it should be in a marriage respect in public and in private. So that just gives you a small picture of what a day at camp is like. I've been aware of Voice for Girls Camp since 2014, and this group has reached 65,000 girls in seven states of India and originates in Telangana. The camps are run mainly in English, with sometimes the instructions repeated in the local language. Overall, the program emphasizes girls' inherent value and helps them imagine themselves as powerful agents. So here's what they're giving the students. The curriculum, um, which is thorough and thoughtful, has um, a lot about bodies, um, it gives you information about your changing body in adolescent, about getting your period, about reproductive health, but it also teaches them assertiveness training. It teaches them about outer beauty versus inner beauty. Um, it teaches them about decision-making and future planning. Um, it gives them life skills. Problem solving involves time and scenario planning. Negotiation involves working past no planning ahead and financial literacy, and it gives them leadership skills, listening and practicing good communication, delegating, identifying strengths and weaknesses, and win-win solutions. And um, what I wanna say is that this hearing about all this ambitious information and the idea that the girls were also practicing their English, I was really kind of startled and I thought, how does this work? How is it? that girls who are that young are remembering the information. There's so much of it. And how is it that the program can show me that they're actually doing something with it? 
Um, because developmentally at that age, a lot goes in and then, you know, doesn't stay there, right? So that's one of the reasons I was intrigued to learn more about this. I want to acknowledge that at first glance, you know, voice can seem like a neoliberal invest in girls in developing countries program because it's not giving girls capital. It's not telling them there are more jobs or to go ask the government for more jobs. Um, it is more individual growth based. And I recognize that that is a limitation. However, rather than repeating a well covered argument about an organization's neoliberal tendency, I'm in, I was concerned instead with understanding how this particular camp is effective on its terms. Um, I wanted to better understand the pressing need to convey this information and also how it was received. So why is the camp effective? Well, first let me tell you about my methods, sorry. Um, so as social scientists will be interested to know, um, I used, of course, participant observation and interviews with 60 campers. Those took place in eight focus groups, which would mean small groups sitting in a circle, and eight solo interviews. The girls are nearly all from Dalit communities. Um, many were Hindu and Christian. Um, there were 10 counselors I interviewed who are students from universities and six members of the voice staff. The Telugu interviews I did were translated by Aruna Patapati, and I'm very grateful to her. She translated on the spot as well as translating late into the night, um, writing down the words. So I was able to follow the conversation as it unfolded and ask further questions. So the camp uses a scaffolded knowledge structure, and that's part of why it's effective. It doesn't give the girls just one dose of this information. First, there is a, an introduction camp held in the summer before eighth standard, which would begin with some of this information. Then during winter break, the same girls come back for building on the previous knowledge and stressing more of life skills. Then finally, Saki Sister Leader Camp is the third camp the following summer which cultivates leadership qualities with the explicit goal of having the campers eventually circulate the information from all three camps and reach the peers who never even got to go to camp. And I should say that these are all free camps, but the girls do have to give up their vacation time, their holiday time, and the parents do have to say, yes, they can stay at the school. Um, luckily, Voice is able to convince the girls to stay because they have made such a great curriculum. During that third leadership camp, each class of about 30 elects two leaders who will then meet with other students throughout the year and also and to share this information, but also serve as mentors so that if a girl um, is having trouble with something in her life, she can turn to this girl and remember and learn from this information. Um, one of the ways that girls agree to give up their time and that parents um, understand this is a good program is the camp promotes the teacher as sister difference. So and it's an entirely different atmosphere in the camp from the girls' regular school days. These girls are from large cities, they're fun to get to know, but also they're not teachers who mark them. Um, they're just called Akka, uh, not, not anything more deferential than older sister. Um, and they're not sharing their lessons through chalk and talk, but instead through activity-based learning. They have seven lessons a day, but have a variety of exercises that allow them to move, act, and play, rather than simply hear and sit in their seats. The emphasis is on discovery. So they do skits, problem solving, scenario building, games, they use real objects, they take pieces of paper and put them into little paper balls and vote for things that way. And I'm sure that you all, I'm sure that you all sitting here in front of your Zoom, your sorry, your uh, StreamYard screens, and I'm sure you've been hunched over your devices for a while, you understand that of course we involve more of ourselves if we can involve our body, spirit, and mind in our learning. It helps us with ret retention and ongoing engagement. And knowing that, um, voice does a lot with energizers. And you can see the girls on the left in the screen. We get up um, every hour to hour and a half and we do fun 
you know, songs and rhymes, peel banana. There's one in Malayalam that I learned. Um, there's the hokey pokey. And we basically appeal to multiple ways of learning. And what's also really nice is we shake off the old information and prepare our bodies for the new information. So it's really a, a wonderful way to build variety into the day and keep the girls' attention. I'm going to end my slides now um, and return to them later and tell you a little bit more about my conversation with the girls. So what do girls retain and value? That was one of my main questions. The most relevant topics they said were the importance of inner beauty versus outer beauty, planning for the future, particularly declining early marriage and speaking up to finish their education, and brainstorming and negotiation. Those were skills that they hadn't heard about before in their schools, in their government schools mainly. Um, and that was really important to them. Also understanding their bodies and the normalcy of the menstrual process. And this topic rose to the top for the staff and the counselors too. They explained to me that this was vital to girls' self-acceptance. And I really saw that. Um, I really saw that if a girl thinks a natural bodily process that happens to her is lesser or dirty, it's hard for her to accept her whole self and her right to belong in the world and get equal opportunities. <clears throat> in focus groups and interviews, the girls uh, said they were willing to debate their parents if they pressured them to leave school whether they were pressuring them to leave school to help at home or to get married, they were much more willing to debate their parents about this fundamental right to education. And many girls said before camp, they didn't understand the law states a girl can and should finish schooling before getting married. As one counselor said, we talk about reproductive health and how a woman is not ready physically and mentally to take care of a baby before the age of 18 years, she has to mature. And the program um, helps them see that an uneducated young wife has nothing to fall back on, even though her future might include widowhood or abuse or other forms of vulnerability. When I asked the campers the direct question of how they might convince someone the camp was effective, they said, well, we know we have been trying to stop cousins' early marriage, friends' early marriage, my own early marriage, calling the child helpline to report illegal marriages. Um, they, they were enlisting older siblings to help change the parent's mind. So that I think was incredibly important. Um, this was not just textbook abstract knowledge, they were putting it in practice. Thinking about how the campers' attitudes changed over time, um, there was also a growing anti-dowry feeling that the counselors and the campers commented on. For instance, one counselor said to me, it's getting there because we ask our students to do a lot of skits on stuff like child marriage or dowry. And each one of them, I mean, they have very strong opinions about it, about how wrong it is. And, you know, they say, why, why is it that we girls don't get dowry at the time of marriage? And then another counselor listening said, yes, one of the girls in my class, she said, dowry, are you selling me or something? Like, you're selling me. I don't understand. I get married and you're getting the money? I'm the product, what? I don't understand this. So the counselors were of the opinion that while enormous change would not be seen, the combination of school, camp, and more forward-looking society was creating incremental change. I do want to mention that, of course, as is evident in previous scholarship and is confirmed in the work of organizations like this one, having the example of the strong earning power of a wife before a community can help to convince many families to keep daughters in school. Similarly, Pradhan Singh and Mitra found that attitudinal change results from women's higher earning capacity. It's not a guarantee, 
but it often eventually allows her more mobility and greater access to less stigmatized work and therefore more also more household decision-making power. And I know that Luke, Luke and Munshi have found when looking at South Indian women tea plantation workers, that historically disadvantaged groups might have more energy than you would expect to fight these old ideas because their agricultural occupations have not led to building intergenerational prosperity. So they're more motivated than ever. One thing I should tell you too, in terms of understanding how the girls were absorbing these lessons is they were becoming critical thinkers. Um, multiple girls, in fact, specifically requested that this information be circulated to the elders in their community. They felt it was critical information for them, but they also said, change will not really take place unless you come and give this camp to my grandmother and to my mother. They don't understand. When we come home and we explain to them that a period, a menstrual period is not dirty, they say we're wrong. And we know that we're right. We know we are accurate, but they don't believe us. And so I think the camp actually has to be given to the elders. And I found that to be refreshing because they were unafraid to criticize what was happening, the camp, and also that they saw exactly what would be most beneficial. We have to listen to our girls. Another interview, just a brief um, clip to give you a sense of that critical thinking happening. Let me read to you a small bit of it. A cam the camper says, before answering your question, and this was a very shy person, she was very bashful and she didn't talk much when she was with other girls. But in her interview, she said, before answering your next question, I have a question inside. I have never asked anybody. Can I ask you? I said, sure. She says, India is told to be a secular country. While celebrating Independence Day, we bring a card of Bharat Mata and we put a garland on national leaders. And don't you think we're not being secular? In schools, the celebration happens and the principal comes and they break a coconut. But that's not Christian and that's not Muslim. So how can we call India a secular country? All religions should be equal, right? And I was just really struck by the camps allowing her to voice those thoughts out loud. She was questioning. She was putting together these different categories and trying to make sense and asking critical questions. So an unexpected found finding of my study is that the camp transforms not just the girls, but the counselors the counselors themselves. These are girls who are 20 years old. They go to universities, um, 20, 23, 25 years old. They go to universities like University of Hyderabad um, or Delhi University. Some are college age students, some are university students. And these are highly educated urban middle class and upper class women who have a lot of you know, mobility, independence and decision making. Um, and yet they also learn from camp. And I'm sorry, I'm just trying to find my, yes, correct notes here. They also spoke frankly about how they too suffered from limited information and exposure to real world scenarios. For example, one woman made this parallel between young women from vastly different backgrounds. She was pained knowing that some of her campers would be forced to marry at age 15. But yet she said some of her own very religious friends chose to marry at age 18. And she said she had made peace with it because it's their personal choice. Another counselor said to, to me, this camp helped me personally because I was very conservative before I got to college. We live in Kerala and I was one of three sisters and I was very quiet. I knew about gay people because I attended school in a big city, Hyderabad, and that helped me think about how I used to be and how I am now. No one would have thought I would feel the way I do now about things if they knew me when I was younger, and Voice for Girls Camp helped me articulate that. Other 
counselors talked about how they also had received very little information about their menstrual period before training at Voice. For instance, one counselor said, I've had personal experience with this. It happened to me. I got my period one afternoon and no one was home. No one had said anything. And I thought something terrible had happened because blood was coming out of me. I thought maybe I'm dying. When my mother came home, she said, this process has begun and it happens now. It will happen every month. But that is all the information I got. And I don't think that's right. This is something we all have. We should all know about it. In fact, the material is in the school curriculum, but teachers won't talk about it. It's too taboo, so no one ever gets that information. So I want to again say that the camp is not everything. It can't do everything or be everything to everyone. It can't give these girls capital for small enterprise. They will still, these girls will still fight to find employment. And we know that clearly globalization policies have only made that worse. They're creating, you know, permanent white collar manufacturing or service jobs for an extremely small amount of people in India, especially relative to the number of job seekers. And workers in small scale export industries hardly receive fair working conditions. And they know this. They will gain awareness that most women's labor is voluntarily part time and, par and or poorly compensated. And in these circumstances, educated girls will still be pressured to marry early and to older men to assure the family her economic future is established. So I'm not trying to say Voice for Girls is magic, but the findings suggest Voice for Girls does impart an ambitious range of skills important in their own right, and that they found an effective structure to do so, right, with the scaffolded knowledge, with the teachers as sisters, with the curriculum, with the local examples, um, with the three-part process, et cetera, and with the leadership that goes on past the end of camp. It seems Voice, Voice's stealth re-education is encouraging campers to question, reflect, negotiate, and problem solve, as for instance is shown by the camper's request for asking the program to be given to elders. Perhaps most significantly, voice helps girls access accurate information about bodily processes that are difficult to find elsewhere. And they learn to resist unwanted sexual advances. And although they enter camp afraid to speak of violations they or their family have experienced, they learn how to raise their voice in the future, how to file an FIR, what rights they have, and what to do when you're rights are violated or you see someone else's rights being violated. And now at this point, I'd like to share my screen again and give you um, a slightly American, uh, a little bit of an American perspective on this. So um, I do teach a course um, called India and Social Justice. I bring students to India every winter break, um, or I've been doing so for a long time. And I bring about eight students at a time. Of course, uh, the students do um, research um, on India before they arrive. And they also do some awareness raising and fundraising for organizations that they will visit. Um, before they arrive. And yet, no matter how vigilantly I watch over this, of course, there's always the danger that we will be looked at as engaging in what my colleague Asha Sen in her talk referred to as white saviorism. It's something that I always um, am trying to be on guard against and to help my students uh, be aware of and fight against. 
I can't say we're perfect or that we're always successful, um, but that is something we very much bear in mind that we don't want to seem as though we are these uh, rescuers coming in from a Western country with some kind of um, superiority complex. So we were lucky enough this time to be able to um, share ideas from a similar curriculum as Voice for Girls uh, at an organization we spend seven days at and we've been going to and I've been involved with since 2008 in many different capacities. I've been a volunteer there. I've been, I'm on the international board of um, RT for Girls and um, have been working closely with their director for many years. So I brought my students to RT for Girls in Karapa and um, here is just a little bit about their mission. As you can see, their tagline is helping girls help themselves. They foster and support abandoned girls in Kadapa by providing them with a home and education. Many of these girls are the third or far, fourth daughter in a very low income household. And the parents are giving them up because they're worried about having enough money to feed them. And the organization also works to change mindsets about women in the larger community by sending the girls out as adolescent girls, as ambassadors for girls, if you will, to show that girls can learn and earn to village elders. And so this was a great place to be able to have my students um, learn about change on the ground in India. In India. Like I said, we had the opportunity to teach um, some of the students um, there, some of the ideas that we, um, that Voice for Girls teaches. Um, and just a few pictures of us engaging in those activities. I want to just briefly tell you that we did have a group of boys that came in. Um, they come to RT school. They don't live at RT for Girls, but they do go to RT school. And um, again, these are low-income boys. And we were able to talk about many of the things I've mentioned to you already, financial literacy, planning for the future, negotiation skills, but we also got special permission to talk about the menstrual cycle and to talk about changing bodies of boys and girls in adolescence. And um, I wanna tell you a little bit about that. First of all, there were some teachers at RT for Girls who did not like this idea. They didn't want the boys to know this information. They didn't think it was proper. There were also some concerns amongst the girls themselves. They didn't want the boys to know about their bodies or about menstruation. They already had been teased by the boys and they said, this will just make it worse. Um, I think we were able to uh, gently at least open their minds to the ideas that if boys don't have accurate information, then um, it's worse. So that we can't stop the boys from teasing. We can maybe help them see why they shouldn't tease the girls. And in any case, at least they will know what their sisters and their future wives and their friends um, are going through. And so um, that was um, part of the sort of, we almost had to campaign to do that part of the work. And um, I will frankly admit to you, I was a little terrified. <laughs> um, I would not feel super comfortable talking to seventh standard boys in America about menstrual periods. And in India, where obviously it's a different culture and setting, um, despite long experience with India, I was really thinking about how I could make a mistake or um, maybe it would be difficult or maybe they would think it was too funny and they wouldn't let me speak or they wouldn't let my uh, student Seth speak. So um, I guess I find that really interesting in and of itself that even today, you know, in 2020 and even with the amount of education and being a women's and gender studies professor, it's still difficult to talk about this subject. Um, but it was, I want to tell you, it was very, very gratifying. The boys got very quiet. Of course, there was a little big, bit of giggling and a bit of a shock factor when we passed around the pictures of, you know, girls and boys changing bodies. 
But they also settled down and they did an exercise called period maths, which basically has, you know, they drew the calendar charts and they started plotting this um, imaginary girl, Deepa's, you know, um, menstrual cycle and when she would get it next and how long would it last. And that really helped because the boys kind of feel like they're confident at maths and, and sort of even bringing together the subject of maths with the subject of a taboo bodily process, I think it helped them relax into it a bit more and kind of understand that this was more familiar than they were expecting it to be. And so um, I'm glad to tell you that that actually that part went really well. Um, and the boys it seemed to take on some collective responsibility for understanding that um, teasing your sister about having to buy sanitary napkins or to get them out of her backpack was not at all um, appropriate for a very natural bodily process that everybody gets. So I'll share one of my students' words to wrap up here. Um, two comments from my university students. The girls treat me like family, especially the older ones. I treat them as I would my sisters, teasing and laughing. We're friends, but also more. So this is, she's talking about teaching um, in, at RT for Girls. There's a bond that's hard to explain. It's the complete acceptance of a stranger on both ends. I value what they um, have built there, here. A trust among strangers, friends among sisters. If I had been teaching seventh through 10th standard girls in America, the experience would have been very different. I feel that American kids would have been more disrespectful and visibly disinterested in what the teacher had to say. Um, another person said, I learned the complex process of working with translators and bridging a language and cultural barrier. I adjusted my speech, repeated and emphasized key points, spoke with my hands, and through an immense amount of trial and error, figured out what could be clarified with illustration and demonstration. And then finally, menstruation and period tracking were topics that I felt the girls clinging to every word. I think because it was information they didn't have much access to, as well as it being very applicable to them in their present moment. I feel really honored to be a part of that learning process for them. And I hope the biological knowledge will eliminate shame and stigma. The second most important topic I feel like I talked about was negotiation and advocacy. The power that girls and people in general have within speech is something that can't be overstated. Teaching the workshop was a wonderful experience and I really think I learned more than I taught. And on that note, I will wrap up my talk and ask if there's any questions. Okay, oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. It's a wonderful presentation. It's visual as well as verbal, and so nice to see that someone sitting there still thinking so much about India, about South Asian women, about South Asian students that are doing a wonderful job. There are so many questions. Let me address a few. Um, that um, considering uh, that there is affirmative action in India, uh, don't girl students from the Dalit communities also represent a section of the privileged, at least comparatively? The, the person who asked this question would like to bring up uh, the Dalit community in uh, by speaking of reservations. Yes. I'm going, I'm going to say I don't like doing that, and I'll tell you why. There is so much that we can say about trying to make India a caste-free society that has nothing to do with reservations. And I find that when people move to the topic of this political policy right away, they often are not spending any time thinking about 
unjust conditions that have nothing to do with reservations. Um, I, I recognize that's an important topic, but we can get very distracted by getting down in the weeds amongst the small details of reservations instead of thinking, how can I be part of the change? How can I make Dalit lives matter? How am I witnessing people being actively prejudiced or even subtly prejudiced against people from this community right in front of me? To me, that's far more important and we have far more power to, to affect change <laughs> by thinking of that. <laughs> okay. So, um, there is another question there. Um, what about the boys who need to unlearn certain things that are fed to them since birth? Mm -hmm. So the questioner is asking, what can we think about when we're trying to help boys uh, revalue girls? Yes. Yes. It's a very fine question. There is only a limit, you're right, to what we can do if we only work with girls. So first I, I want to say, I think working with boys on gender sensitization is extremely important. And for men who are tuning into this talk, thank you for being here as well. Um, one, I think the questioner is smart in asking the question the way he or she asked it, because I think what I learned from previous studies is that there's a danger that boys are thinking that somehow biologically they are entitled to be the superior sex, to receive attention, physical attention and otherwise from girls and women. And then the girls themselves internalize this as if to say that boys can't change. That was one of the things I discovered is that there are even women of privilege who explained to me in India, they felt that men were biologically incapable of seeing their position because they are not good at adjusting. <laughs> <laughs> they are they're not the adjusters, <laughs> right? Just adjust. Right. Yes. <laughs> so I found myself thinking we have to give men a little bit more credit for being yes. flexible, <laughs> flexible thinkers. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> yes. So uh, we need to change the outset or, or of our mouth, mind from the very beginning or else it is really tough uh, for the boys uh, uh, at a later stage to change their mindset and to think in a different way. But you were telling about um, a dreaming uh, India as a caste-less society. Is it at all possible in US also? Do you ever think uh, that uh, US where there will be no bar on ca caste and class? Is it at all possible? I think we are in a very important historic moment where we're realizing that our hypercapitalist ways and our white supremacist ways have led us to disaster. We can't build anything truly substantial and good for the large, larger community unless we start to dismantle what we've had in the past. And I'm hopeful that we can use this forward momentum to create change, but I know it won't be fast. And I also know there will be a lot of people who are resisting it. So it's going to take huge effort, um, but I think I, I'm hopeful that this health crisis, which has caused everybody to slow down and rethink could lead to some new activism and action. <laughs> um, uh, at the same time, don't you think that there is a huge difference between practicing and preaching? Someone is telling that yeah. there is a huge difference uh, between practicing and preaching in India and as well as in in US also. What is your take on it? Yes, um, I think this person is saying 
we there, we call it lip service. It's very easy to to say inspiring words and then go back home and comfortably sit in front of the television and do nothing. So, I mean, I'm afraid that's that's part of the problem, right? The people who have the power to do the most are the most comfortable, and therefore, if they can't be bothered, it. It, that's that's the difficult part, right? We have to get people at every level invested in change. Um, and so I think the speaker's right to, to point that out. Um, and there is another question um, from Nasima. She's asking that, do you think that with such invested workshop with adolescent boys and girls, it's possible to sensitize this young mind so that they don't fall prey to their lifelong patriarchal conditioning. Um, what is the, your take on it? So the person wants to know if it's possible to be effective, I think? Uh, is it possible to, uh, to sensitize the young minds so that they don't think uh, from a patriarchal set of mind? Okay. Is it possible? I think it's best if we break it down. So is it possible to get fewer boys on the street to say rude things to girls? I think it's possible. <laughs> is it possible to get the auto driver to safely take a girl from point A to point B with no comments about her? I think it's possible, right? So I think rather than, I, I know that it's of course extremely important to see the patriarchal mindset, but even let's just take it in small bits. And sometimes um, maybe it's all right to focus on one small thing at a time, even if it's something like menstruation, even if it's something like, you know, um, I, I'm not trying to say those things are small. I'm trying to say that perhaps when we break it down into smaller parts, we can see the change in more um, visible ways. But it, and I'm not saying it's not hard, I'm saying it's possible. <laughs> okay, okay. There is another question that what, according to your study, was the notion of gender and sexuality among the um, village girls? And do you think there uh, are traditional methods of addressing these issues? Um, I'm sorry, could you say the phrase about gender and sexuality one more time? Uh, what, according to your study, was the notion of gender and sexuality among the village girls? Ah, okay. So these girls have been at RT for girls for a long time, most of them. So they are aware that, um, I, I mean, I guess what I would say is they know there are gay people and straight people they know that women um, should be able to say no to sex at any time, even in marriage. Um, they know that everybody should be treated equally and that skin color should not be the basis for saying someone is pretty or less pretty. These are the kinds of things they know. Um, I don't know that every single one of the girls um, who is 13 and up at RT for Girls would answer every question the same way or would not, or, or would for instance be open to um, feminine presentations that were non-traditional. But I can tell you that I brought a transgender student to RT for Girls a couple of years ago. And the, the girls, although they were a little, I could tell they were, you know, kind of um, uncertain or questioning sort of how do I see this person? How do I make sense of this person? They really were very welcoming and they really did put some of those skills of just, I want to be welcoming to every person who crosses this gate. Um, they really put that in action and um, any kind of initial um, sort of hesitation, I, I saw go away after a day or two. So um, I'm really happy to say these are um, these are things we really can feel hopeful about. I, I, it's not textbook knowledge, it's knowledge I've seen in action. So, and I think that there are some kind of traditional methods also that can address this kind of issues. 
uh, tell me more there are some kind of traditional systems also that can address all these issues it means uh, do you think that there must have be some uh, set of rules that one should adhere to in order to get accustomed to the kind of system that we are all talking about mm. oh that's a wonderful wonderful statement because the truth is even in my country women's and gender studies is not required for all uh first year university students when so many other <laughs> courses are required you know very basic courses economics or um you know all kinds of things are required um and so that is something we should i guess all be thinking about how will this very important information be circulated widely um not in a casual haphazard way because uh, honestly i do feel it's the field of women's and gender studies that has helped us come to these insights and recognize how vital it is to rethink um these gender straight jackets or gender very small gender boxes that we're all stuffed into um and so um, obviously i would hope that everyone could sort of have a gender and sex 101 course but i don't know how to make that happen <laughs> if but you have to tell me <laughs> i want to be a part of it <laughs> part of it but don't you think that while we are talking about gender often we term um, feminism or feminist studies or uh, or women as the prime focus of gender but at the same time men are also there transgender communities are also there lgbt communities are also there all are the, um, come under the term gender and he, uh, and in that context uh, what will be your take when uh, we are uh, going through such phase uh, where we have to tell that black lives matter mm -hmm. so what will be your take on it don't you think that the black women or black men still they are not gay not getting that much focus and they are being exploited uh, rationally and they are being exploited consciously so what will be your take on it and uh, and when recently we have come across that floyd incident so don't you think that while we are practicing or or we are talking this kind of things but we are unable to do or think rationally while we are behaving or while we are talking with a black women or a black men mm -hmm. um correct we um when we think about um the way white uh for instance the way white women uh survivors of violence are treated um differently from the way that uh, in in the courtroom for instance or, or even in the police station or even just in the with friends in the public where the women of color are treated differently than um white women when they are reporting crimes when they're talking about violence and violation that has happened to them on college campuses or elsewhere the more what we need to do is continue to put pressure on the administration on um organizations like the police and police unions to to change actually um to address the problems we see on the ground differently and to get rid of the militarization of the police which is a incredibly i mean it it just shocks me that we in this country have allowed this to happen that we are giving military gear to police um and then expecting them not to try to use it i mean to try to and not to like absorb that as if they are supposed to be um in a war um that we are trusting through our laws an officer to say what is reasonable um and what is not reasonable and that the police officer always has in some sense the final say that's absolutely unacceptable and um i've been with my brother and sister protesters trying to draw attention to that thanks a lot yes yes we need to come forward to do this kind of activities i'm just um, there is a question that um while you were talking about um uh menstruation and um, other things um 
how boys and men um, is it a uh, kind of observation that um, is it possible that how boys and men could be sensitized about menstruation so i think i answered that in the talk as to how we did that um so i'm not quite sure how to answer yes 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 uh, in a very precise way how we look at this that uh, oh more that, more precise yeah yeah okay yeah. okay thanks um so we first drew a picture of the you know inside of the woman's body on the blackboard and we um showed them all the parts and they wrote it down in their notebooks and we talked about the um lining um of the uterus and the egg coming out and how um this 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 needed to be released so you could prepare for the next um cycle and we talked to them about uh the way that the egg would or would not get fertilized so we did briefly mention actual um sexual practice but you know just very briefly um and i mentioned that to you only because again girls and boys you may think they know what creates a baby or what makes a person pregnant but actually often they don't really understand the mechanics in terms of what could actually get them pregnant and that's part of the problem right the lack of knowledge is is really important to um clarify and um there was i'm trying to think um then we did the period maths we talked about the disposal of the sanitary napkins we talked about how you you can't reuse the same cloth if you're using cloth you can't reuse the same cloth or you could um get an infection we talked about drying the cloths in the sun to make sure that they were completely dry and clean after after washing them we talked about um how the sanitary napkins would have to be disposed of you know by being wrapped up in newspaper and being put away properly not not being there for some someone or some animal to come along and um smell the blood or create more you know mess um and so we tried to explain how the the blood itself is not dirty blood it's not any different from any other kind of blood or tears or anything else that comes from your body um and um it is not polluting it is not impure um just like we all talk about going to the toilet we have to talk about this part too right so yes you know even in india girls in that condition are not allowed to to enter the, the temples and they are not allowed to uh, do the worship and so so many things that we are so superstitious that um still those things are considered as taboos in india and in other south asian countries and very asem to I think that uh, yes we are talking about this this issues but uh, but i think that charity begins at home we should um, start <laughs> practicing this kind of habits in our home at first so yes yeah that's there that's the point there this mm-hmm. wonderful uh, there is another question uh, this is the last, last question i am taking um that uh, prohit is there uh, he is telling that uh, he is motivated to conduct action oriented research like you which involves participation and engaging with subject kindly guide us in this path and what are the sources or works we should acquaint ourselves with in order to be able to conduct such type of research mm. this is the kind of a small guidance that you can give to all the participants okay um the participatory action research is really um important and um great grassroots approach so i'm really glad that that's the person's orientation to the topic there's a lot of good work out there um nancy shepherd's work um would be of particular interest to you um i'm trying to think i could also be happy to email you some sources and links if you yes, yes. yeah so you have my email mm-hmm. um but maybe more generally What I love about participatory action research is that you are basically making your subjects your co-collaborators and you're asking them what is most important and vital to you that other people know about this. You know, what do you think are the problems and issues and debates and how would you resolve them? and i think that relationship building leads to it's it's time consuming work and it's very um sometimes it takes a lot of patience 
um, to, I guess, um, come to those conclusions with the group. It's a very democratic form of decision making, of course. But I think um, situated where you are, you have plenty of um, really important on the ground work that remains to be done. And um, so I just really wanna encourage you to think big and to uh, stay with it, even when it feels like a very long project. Okay. So I would like to personally thank you for a wonderful presentation. And judging from the comments of those who attended and judging from the questions that you've received on WhatsApp, it seems that the third day also seemed to be very successful and most of the credit goes to you and the others who gave such interesting presentation. And especially your presentation, it was it was a kind of graphical presentation. It was verbal as well as it was the visual. So we hope that you will want to be involved in our future initiative. And we are pleased to have your participation in this seven-day international level online faculty development program on gender sensitization. And I personally thank you for your valuable contribution. And we need social activists like you to change our mindset, to think in a different way, and, and to break that hierarchy that is still there on the very basic foundation of gender. So thanks a lot. Thanks for being there and thanks for the wonderful work that you are doing. You are an inspiration to many of us who are trying to sensitize our brains, our minds and our thinking thinking capacity. Thanks for all the efforts you are. Thank you so much. Honor to be here. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to end it uh, in the session and um, I'm requesting all the participants that I have um, uh, sent you the feedback uh, that assignment form in the chat box. And um, I'm very much looking forward to view the fourth day of our seminar. Till then, be safe, be at home. And thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Okay.